Hello, everyone. Uh, I sincerely hope that you must have enjoyed your uh, holidays. Uh, we'll start our discussion on the microbiology. And it's very rare that uh, someone working in the diagnostic lab become excited. But the miracles do happen, and sometimes the microbiologist working in the microbiology diagnostic lab become excited. And these gentlemen who are working in the lab have become excited just because they have seen something that has relevant to the fried eggs. There's something which is raised in between and it has the thin edges. They're very excited what it is. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, all of you, uh, at least uh, some of you must have had a big fast today with the fried eggs. And if I ask someone of you that, uh, how many calories are there in a fried eggs? Uh, maybe you can guess, maybe it's, uh, it all depends that you have taken the full fried eggs or you have taken the half fried eggs, you have taken the fried eggs with the one toast or the two toast, that all depends. But generally speaking, uh, what happens that uh, normally, you see, if you take a boiled egg, it contains almost 38 calories, and if you take a fried egg, it's full fried eggs, it has almost 90 calories. But I have nothing to do with the calories. I just want to get your attention towards the appearance of the fried eggs that when fried egg, it is raised in the center and it has, you see, the thin edges. I do not mean that the organism that we are going to discard, it forms a colony that are, that are color like fried eggs. No, they resemble like fried eggs, means that they are raised in the centers, but they are thinner at the, at the at the edges, particularly the outer edges. And the organism that have this kind of, uh, uh, you see, appearance under the microscope and the laboratory, after you put them under the incubator for, all, for about a week's time, belongs to the genus what we call as the mycoplasma. The mycoplasma are the smallest microorganisms. And they resemble almost the size of the viruses. They're too small and they are the intestinal microorganisms. And the colonies of the mycoplasma, when we culture them out to the respective uh, selective agar, they appear raised in the centers, but they are thin edges. And of course, they have some something uh, uh, resembling with that of the mycoplasma, but that of the egg. So please remember that the mycoplasma colonies are raised in the centers, but they are thin at the outer edges. <laughs> And we have the mycoplasmids, the family, and the members of this family, uh, they are the smallest self-replicating, free-living microorganism. And these organisms, they belong to the gram-negative uh, categories because they do stain to very weak extent the gram-negative staining, but they lack peptidoglycan. If you remember, uh, in your classification of the bacteria, you must have studied that uh, we have a cell wall deficit microorganism. The microorganisms do not have the cell wall. The lacking in peptidoglycan means that they do not have the cell wall. They are flexible microorganisms. So the mycoplasma are the microorganisms which are cell wall deficit microorganisms. So because they don't have the cell wall, uh, so the, the cell membranes are very flexible. So when an organism it does have a flexible cell wall or cell membranes, or it does not have the cell wall, and it has cell membranes only. This cell membrane is again a flexible, so it can assume any shape. It has a spectrum of shapes. It can occur in crocus shape, it can be filamentous in shape, it can be donuts in shape, it can be club shaped, or it may be helical in shape. So if an organism does not have a cell wall, it, has, it can attain any shape. The mycoplasma are cell by deficit organism and they do not have any shape. So they can assume any shape like cocci, filamentous, donors, clubs, and clinical shape. Now, if an organism, it does not have a cell wall, it is very difficult to stain this microorganism because the basic philosophy of the gram stains are the acid fast stain, it lies on to the cell wall compositions. And if an organism, it does not have a cell wall, it means we cannot stain this microorganism to the extent that we can see that microorganism on the microscope. So in order to visualize such kind of microorganism under the microscope, we'll have to go for the other techniques that we will discuss. So the organism has a different, it, has a, it does not have a peptidoglycan, 
if it is there, it's very small in content, uh, and therefore it does it has a flexible uh, appearance, and we cannot stain this microorganism. So cell wall deficit microorganism, because of the lack of uh, what you call as the, uh, because of the lack of the peptidoglycan layer, we cannot stain this microorganism. The cell membrane of these microorganisms also has the cholesterol. It has a steroid body. And uh, this organism, it requires a very complex media for its growth. It cannot be grown on ordinary culture media that we use for the diagnostic purpose in the microbiology laboratory. Uh, it has it needs to see it needs steroid fatty acids, and it also needs preformed purines and pyrimidines to grow, because the organism is an intercellular microorganism. It goes inside the cell and it macro it synthesizes its own macromolecules and it makes its own DNA, and then it you see replicates. So the same uh, the basic requirement for its growth we need in the in vitro isolation microorganism. The colonies of the microorganism, as we said in the very beginning, they are pie like colonies of the microorganism. They can grow onto a microplasma media, or we call it a atoms medium, which is a specialized medium uh, that we can grow on this, uh, uh, that we can need to grow for this microorganism. The microplasma pneumonia, which is, a, which is one of the members of the microplasma, uh, it is very difficult to grow. It takes at least one week's time to grow, and it needs some of the very rich complex. Uh, requirements, the macromolecules like pyridine, pyrimidine, and the fatty acids and steroids. Now, if you look at the pathogenic genera and the species of the mycoplasma, we have mycoplasma pneumonia, we have mycoplasma hominis, and we have a very newly discovered species of mycoplasma, what we call as the mycoplasma incognitus. Uh, these mycoplasma, particularly the mycoplasma pneumonia, hemianus, uh, they cause pneumonia. What we call as the atypical pneumonia. We will discuss it in details while we will discuss the pathogenesis of this microorganism. And there is some deviation, some differences from the mycoplasma, and we have a separate general on what we call as the urea plasma. The urea plasma uriticum is the species. This causes, you see, the, the, uh, the infection in the UTI. UTI infection. So the mycoplasma pneumonia, mycoplasma hemiris, and the newly discovered species like mycoplasma incognitus, they cause as are involved in the pneumonia, where the urea plasma uretic, which is a which is a deviation from the classical genera of plasma, mycoplasma, it, this causes a, a UTI uh, disease. Now we'll take first the mycoplasma pneumonia. As we said in the earlier stage, the organisms are the smallest microorganism, they are cell wall deficit microorganism, they are peeling the microorganism, so they cannot be stained with the gram stains procedures, and they need specialized stimulants to be by the microscope under the microscope. Then they stain poorly with gram stains. They do get some stains, but we the stain is so poor that we cannot even enhancing the time of the counter stain or by Increasing the concentration of the counter stain or other staining chemicals that we use over here, uh, we cannot really uh, uh, identify this microorganism uh, by the staining procedure. Uh, the inhibitors of cell wall synthesis uh, is ineffective, uh, means uh, that if we add some of the inhibitors that could inhibit the cell wall synthesis, but we have a pill pure morphic microorganism, uh, as we said. It can attain any shape because it has a flexible cell membrane. So same properties that we have generalized in the, in the family. Uh, the membranes, uh, they are rich with the cholesterol and they grow on a complex artificial medium with several lipids, with several fatty acids. They need purine, they need primidine also. They grow very slowly, require at least one week time to grow. But the characteristic colony that appears after incubation of one week's time from the sample of the, of the patient, they appear like fried like. Please remember, they're not yellow in color. They're not white in color. Not yellow in color in the center, but they're not white in color in the periphery. But they are raised in the center, and they have, you see, the thinner outer edges. So they appear, they resemble with the, with the fried eggs, with reference to its morphology, not because of its chromology, it's not because of colors, 
the colors they do not really signify but the appearance of the fried egg it signifies colonies are like fried egg means that they are raised on the centers and they are thinner out at its outer edges all right now what is the pathogenesis of the microorganism uh, this organism uh, is really pathogenic for the humans only the animals uh, they are not uh, they are not uh, uh, you see uh, affect, uh, affected by this microorganism and the transmission of this microorganism is by the respiratory droplets so the organism is rod shaped and it has a tapered uh, you see the tip that contains specific respiratory attachment proteins the organism is the is, is like a rod and its one end is tapered and this tapered one end has a specific proteins that have the affinity for the attachment to the proteins present in the respiratory tract so it has a specific affinity for the proteins uh, present in the respiratory tract the organism it does not invade the epithelium it's it's not an a microorganism it does not have any any plasma it does not have any fibri that support its penetration into the into the mucosa but it causes what you call as the stasis of the cilia it causes inhibition of the movements of the cilia what we call the cilia stasis and later on it can go into the necrosis process the mechanism of for this is not that clear uh, but it do produce some of the what you call as the uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, that really damage the respiratory tract uh, cells uh, that contributes to its its, uh, uh, its pathogenesis uh it has been seen that the organism it invades the host immune system detection that mean it prevent itself from the detection by the host immune system and the organism it become resistant to antimicrobial treatment because of its intra cellular survival and it causes the mucous membrane membrane barriers so uh, fuse with the host cells and then it survive intracellularly uh in addition to the immune system and visions by intracellular localization it can change the composition of the cell membrane the organism has designed itself to that extent that it can change the cell membrane and the cell membrane they mimic with the cell membrane of the human cells so because of the resemblance you see the immune system cannot detect it so by the immune the immune system cells they cannot recognize it so the sensitivity can result into the autoimmune disorder because the cell has the ability the bacterial cell has the ability to modify or configure its cell membrane that resemble or mimic, mimic with that of the cell membrane of the human cell so the cell immune system the immune system cannot recognize it and this can also result into the autoimmune problem that we will discuss in the next slides so it the organism had just one serotype but antigenic differences uh, from the species it does occur uh it provides just incomplete immunity because of intracellular survival and the second episode is likely to be occurs because of this disease the treatment even for the recommended dosage of time for the recommended uh, 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 therapeutic uh, concentration the organism survive in the body so it uh, the relapses are there and there is incomplete uh, immunity because of the intracellular survival of the spike organism the active uh, the auto antibodies uh, they are producing as the red cells what we call as the cold agglutinin they are also producing in the veins in the lungs and the hepatocytes now these production of cold agglutinins or the antibodies in the in the rbcs and the other organs of the brain they really elicit what you call as the autoimmune diseases or autoimmune complications of this infection we will discuss it right now the organism is also worldwide in distribution found everywhere frequent cases in pakistan also and uh, uh, it has increased incidence particularly during the winter season uh, uh, it is one of the most common cause of uh, pneumonia in young adults particularly all those young adults which uh, which live in confined uh, uh, you see the areas uh, college students uh, living in the dormitories of the hostels college student i mean uh, collectively studying uh, in the in the classrooms the military barracks uh, young military recruits they are more prone to this infection during the winter season 
and it's one of the main cause of atypical pneumonia about 10 to 20 percent of the cases of the atypical pneumonia they are because of this mycoplasma pneumonia infection as i said earlier that uh, the incubation period varies from two to three weeks and after the entrance of the microorganism uh, till the production of signs and symptoms it takes about two to three weeks times now uh, it causes what we call as the atypical pneumonia and particularly we call it what we call it as a primary atypical pneumonia now what is the difference between the typical pneumonia and atypical pneumonia we already uh, we know that we studied in staphylococcus uh, uh, pneumonia the organism the disease caused by staphylococcus pneumonia is left to be as a typical as a typical pneumonia as a typical pneumonia what does this means that uh, the organism we can go on to the normal laboratory media the organism can be grown on to the uh, laboratory normal laboratory media means like on to the blood agents and the the similarly you see the atypical pneumonia causing microorganism they cannot be grown on to the normal uh, blood agents that we use uh, in the laboratory and uh, atypical pneumonia can also be caused by many other organisms and the three, five, four more important organisms that can cause atypical pneumonia includes we have the Legionella pneumophila, which causes a Legionella disease. We will uh, discuss it if we have not done it already. Uh, the chlamydia pneumonia, the chlamydia pneumonia is another atypical pneumonia. The pneumonia caused by uh, chlamydia stasi, what we call as the stachosis. This again is atypical pneumonia. There is another organism which causes atypical pneumonia, and it is a uh, Coxilla bonetti. Coxilla bonetti is another organism that causes atypical pneumonia. Now, if you look all of these four organisms, the Legionella pneumophila, the Chlamydia pneumoniae, Chlamydia stasi, Coxilla bonetti, they cannot be grown to the ordinary medium like blood agars, like chocolate agars, or like to the to the to the macon, uh, to the nutrient agar they need specialized medium to grow so one main difference is between the main, between the organism that causes atypical pneumonia and typical pneumonia is this that the organism causes uh, typical pneumonia they can be grown on to the blood agar or other routine laboratory medium but the organism those causes atypical pneumonia uh, which we have already mentioned the legionella pneumophila chlamydia pneumonia chlamydia stasi Chlamydia bernetti, they cannot grow onto the blood agar or the robotomy. They need specialized medium, specialized medium incorporated with the specialized macromolecules that are needed for the growth of microorganisms. There are some other viruses that cannot also be grown and uh, they also pass atypical pneumonia, like the influenza virus, the adenoviruses. So we have a group of viruses, the influenza viruses, the group of viruses. We have three, four, five my important microorganisms that causes atypical pneumonia. So the main difference is that you see that the organism causing atypical pneumonia cannot be grown onto the normal laboratory diagnostic medium or isolation medium, uh, but and they require specialized medium. Whereas the organism like the Staphylococcus pneumoniae, which causes typical pneumonia, it can easily be grown onto the blood agar. All right. Uh, the organism, as I said earlier, that they sexually bind to the specific receptors of the respiratory epithelium and they inhibit the action of the cilia. Uh, there is, that is why there is, you see, there is deposition of the mucus in the, in the, in the lung. And uh, disruption to the cilia and it causes the damage to the epithelium. And it is not invasive and it is not having some toxigenic properties. Now, so the main pathogenic potential of this microorganism does not rise onto the production of uh, toxins or by the speed of virulence enzymes, but it mostly uh, become, uh, because it becomes pathogenic because it made the immune system, comes intracellular, and it has crossed the immune barriers, and it can persist to the antimicrobial uh, drug, and it can survive in the uh, human cell intracellularly. Uh, other this organism can produce uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and superoxidase radicals and which are of course the cytotoxic enzymes. They do cause some damage to the respiratory cells, but the absence or recurrence of this microorganism or disease is because of the survival. 
they produce autoantibodies, as I said, uh, against the RBCs and against some of the tissues, like in the brains. And this is what we call the cold agglutinins, which are produced after one to two weeks of uh, infection. Now, the first are the generalized signs and symptoms of the spike organism. Uh, they are the fever, uh, the malaise, the sore throat, headache, generalized signs and symptoms that cannot be distinguished from the other microorganisms that can cause the pharyngitis. And the disease is progressive. And once it progresses, it causes the unproductive cough. There's some nasal signs and the chest pains. So all those symptoms relevant to the, uh, to the involvement of the lungs, uh, uh, lungs become tame, and they have this. Uh, now this is referred to be as what we call as the walking pneumonia. Uh, uh, there is pharyngitis, and later on it may develop into atypical pneumonia uh, with the persistent tag, what we call the, the little scooter, but it goes for a long time. Uh, most common atypical pneumonia, along with the viruses and the young adults, and I repeat for you, please remember it for the rest of your life, that uh, typical pneumonia is caused by streptococcus pneumonia, Atypical pneumonia is caused by three, four uh, important microorganisms. I say it again for you. The organism belongs to the genus Legionella, is the Legionella nemophila, what causes the disease, known as the Legionary disease. Now, Legionary, you see it's a league in the, uh, in the USA. That is, that is a question of the people who work for, uh, for the army. Uh, that is the Chlamydia pneumonia. Uh, then is the chlamydia stasi, which causes the cytokosis. Then is the costly that causes uh, another uh, disease. So these are the four microorganisms, along with that of the influenza and rhinoviruses, which causes atypical pneumonia. And these atypical pneumonia, the most occurs in young adults, particularly working in congested environment, uh, living in close contacts, and uh, like the recruits in the army, military army, living in dormitory students, particularly the college students, and uh, in the college classrooms also. Now, there is a gradual beginning of the non-productive cup in the initial stages. Uh, later on, of course, uh, this throat becomes throat, and there's headache, of course, rapting pains through the ears, and uh, there are small amount of uh, non-bloody sputum. Uh, Constitutive symptoms like headache, fever, maze, and myalgia, and uh, extra pulmonary manifestations of the disease can also occur. Uh, this is because of the, what we have said, the autoimmune complications of this disease. There are three, four normal autoimmune complications of the disease that we have kept in mind. One, what we call as the Steven Johnson syndrome. It is again an autoimmune problem, complication. Uh, Rhythma multiform. Uh, Reynolds phenomenon, and there's one neurological manifestation that we already have discussed in the previous microorganism, what we call as the Guillain Barre syndrome, and sometimes the cardiac arrhythmias, arthralgia, and hemolytic uh, anemia can also take. Now, we will discuss some of these uh, definitions or some of the clinical proofs of these, uh, what you call as the syndromes or manifestations or phenomena of the. Uh, of the mycoplasma pneumonia. Now look at this slide. Uh, I'm not showing you these. This is what we call as the Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Now, uh, please remember that this is not the face of the Steven Johnson, right? This is a patient who is having a syndromes like Steven Johnson described it. Now, what is the syndrome? There is serious adverse reduction, of course, of the skin, particularly of the lips, particularly of the lip skin, and the mucous membrane, particularly of the eyes. And the signs and symptoms they include, you see, you can see the blisters over here, there are rashes, and there is skin pain. So this is because of the uh, autoimmune problem, because of the cold acritonin that can react with the, with the, that of the, uh, 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 with that of the tissues on the, on the skin and the, and the brain even and the, and, and, the, and the RBCs. This is most because of the RBCs. So you can see the Steven Johnson syndromes, uh, there is an uh, inflamed blisters, reddish in color, rashes, and skin pain. This is what we call uh, the Steven Johnson syndrome, which is a complication of the autoimmune, which is a complication of the micro uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. Now, uh, 
Uh, there is uh, another what we call as uh, the rhythm multiformin. This is a hypersensitive reaction, uh, which is triggered by this infection because of the uh, because of the or antibodies produced by this uh, uh, infection. There's typical targeted uh, lesions that can occur onto the onto the palms and onto the on the forearms. And these are acute, they are self-limiting, and even again you see see some of the redness of the of the skin area and the palms of the hand. In the Reynard uh, Sin phenomenon, uh, if you look at this, you see uh, there is spasm of the arteries, and it causes episodes of reduced blood flow. And the fingers and the toes and the nose and the ears and the lips, particularly the extremities, the toes, fingers, nose, ears, they become, you see, they become uh, uh, what you call as the, the bluish in color due to the uh, oxygen depletion in this tissue. And if uh, uh, they become, become white in color, uh, due to uh, inadequate blood supply. So, because of the autoimmune diseases, autoimmune problem, uh, what happens if there is a loose blood supply? It will become, you see, uh, an inadequate blood supply. Your, your toes, your fingers, nose, lips, they become white in color, or uh, uh, they become blue in color due to oxygen depletion. So, this is what you call as the Reynolds syndrome. Now, Glean Barden syndrome, as we all know, that there is rapid onset of muscular weakness, which is caused by the immune system, and it damages the peripheral nervous system of the of the. The changes in the sensation of the pain with muscles weakness, and it begins in the hands and feet. So, particularly the autoimmune problem, they affect the the terminals of the bodies, the hand, feet, nose, ears. Uh, so the lab diagnosis, you see early diagnosis is difficult. We have to rely on to the close clinical observations. Uh, the sputum stain, they will not find any cells because they're intercellular. Leukocytic count is normal. X-ray findings are also non-specific. And we hardly attempt uh, for the culture of the microorganism. So we'll have to rely on to this serological test for the diagnosis of this disease. Uh, we can detect the coagglutinins, particularly the IgM, which is a acute phase antibodies against the RBCs glutenin. Uh, we have the complement tracing test and the DNA diagnostic probe is the best choice for the detection of this microorganism and for the confirmation of the disease in the human body. We have other uh, two microorganisms, the Mycoplasma hominis and Mycoplasma uraniticum. Both of these, they cause sexually transmissible diseases, uh, infection of the genital tract, uh, frequently found in the urethra, vagina, and some of the both. Uh, adults and the newly borns. Uh, initial colonization uh, takes place at the time of birth and then they reduce the number while the childhood. Uh, second colonization persistent uh, can also take place during the uh, sexual intercourse. Uh, Uroplasm ureticum, that's we call it the T stage mycoplasma, uh, normal for about 60% of the sexually active men. So the disease of, of course, the sexually active individuals. Implicating non gonorrhea urethritis and prothritis, and uh, a personistic infection of the fetus and the fetal membrane. This means organisms do survive in the, in the, in the vagina tract and during the process of delivery, it can acquire the organism, uh, like we see in case of chlamydia trachomatis and in case of disease of glory. Uh, appears to cause uh, miscarriage, stillbirth, premature uh, birth and respiratory infections. Uh, humorous, you see, it may cause peripheral inflammatory diseases and what we call as the post abortal and post mortem fevers. Uh, the other organism which is newly recognized is the incognitus. It is again is the intercellular pathogen. It, can be, it has been isolated from the spleen, liver, brain, and blood of the AIDS individuals. The potent cofactor for the rapid cell death. And it also causes flu like symptoms in the HIV negative individuals and it's the immune system as its own. That was all about. Thank you very much.